Hey YouTube, welcome to another edition of Todd Tinkers with Tech. I had a comment on the first video that I did on this little HP small form factor machine asking what I was going to do with it. So I thought I'd make a video and kind of go through some cool stuff you can do with these little cheap small form factor machines. All these machines here are, you can easily pick up used for uh, around 30 bucks, maybe 50 at the most. Um, and you know, there's a lot of really cool, fun stuff you can do with these older, super cheap PCs. So let's get into it. So cheap PCs are usually cheap for a reason. They're outdated and generally slow, but that doesn't mean they should end up in the e-waste pile. I have a particular fondness for small form factor computers like these mini HP and Dell office machines or thin client boxes like this HP T530 or even Chrome boxes which can easily be turned into full-fledged computers thanks to a fantastic script by Mr. Chromebox. I'll put a link in the description for this. A Chromebox is way more expandable than you might think and can be purchased for dirt cheap way less than a comparable Raspberry Pi system. Small form factor means they take up less space and generally lose, use less power than your normal tower computer, which is great, but the small size does limit the expandability internally. You can find fanless versions, which I really like. A lot of the tiny PCs are basically like low power laptops minus the screen. Very similar to a Raspberry Pi, but less expensive and a lot more powerful in many cases. So you could install Windows 10 on these machines and use it like a normal computer, but it's going to be slow and painful compared to a modern machine. The exception might be a Core i7 that is Intel 4th Gen or newer for regular web browsing, etc. These will be fine as long as you have 8 gigs or RAM or more, but I found that running Linux-based packages is where these little machines really shine. So first up, my all-time favorite use for one of these little machines, Kodi Media Center. I was first exposed to Kodi back when it was called Xbox Media Center. I'd installed a mod chip on my original Xbox from 2002, and a team of homebrew programmers came up with XBMC to run on these modded Xboxes. It was super impressive software. It allowed me to access rips of my DVD collection from a network attached drive on my TV. Over the years, the software continued to improve and eventually they changed the name from XBMC to Kodi. So I'm an old school user of Kodi. Kodi automatically scrapes your media and downloads artwork and logos. It'll play almost any kind of codec you can throw at it. Kodi's been ported to almost every operating system as well. And it'll run great on a high-end Mac or PC, but where it really shines is running on these cheap low-end machines. Kodi became a popular mod to install on Amazon Fire Sticks, but I find it works a lot better on a PC that has a bit more RAM and storage than a Fire Stick can provide. But a Chromebox or a thin client is perfect for it. You'll need to add a remote of some sort, like I like the uh, Logitech K400 keyboard that has a built-in trackpad, or these inexpensive air mice that have a keyboard on the back. Kodi has an open structure that accommodates add-ons from an active community of developers that will allow you to stream stuff from all kinds of places on the internet, which I won't really go into here, but let's just say if you can't watch your favorite professional sports team because of blackouts, <coughs> Dodgers cough, <coughs> uh, you might find an add-on to let you stream it. I will say that I'm not a fan of the way Kodi handles music. It's not that robust for audio in my opinion and leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to music, but I use a Kodi machine on every TV in my house to allow me to access rips of the DVDs and Blu-rays I've purchased over the years as well as home video when I feel the need to embarrass my now 19 year old twins. Sorry guys. There's a couple of other media center slash media server apps that have become extremely popular among my fellow geeks recently, primarily Plex and Jellyfin. I honestly don't know too much about these as I've been entrenched in the Kodi universe for so long that I haven't jumped on the Plex slash Jellyfin bandwagon yet. They work a little differently than Kodi as they work as a server that transcodes your media on the fly to client player apps that uh, probably might be built into your smart TVs these days. They require quite a bit more horsepower to run on the server side 
usually an i3 or an i5 minimum, to be able to transcode your video on the fly. I know they offer the ability to share your media with others outside your homeware net network, which is definitely intriguing. Jellyfin is open source, while Plex is a commercial product requiring a subscription fee to get all the features, but a free tier is available. I'll be experimenting with Plex and Jellyfin soon. Let me know your thoughts on Plex versus Cody versus Jellyfin in the comments. I'm curious uh, what you guys think. Next up, Retro Gaming with Batocera or RetroPie. So one of the great things you can do with one of these cheap PCs is to turn it into a retro gaming powerhouse. This is one of the main things that pulled me into my tinkering pursuits way back when. I remember being blown away by arcade emulation through MAME on my Mac Quadra way back in the early 90s, but video game emulation has come a long way since then. And running on Linux, it's just fantastic. There's something great about showing your kids, when I was a kid, we only had 160 by 192 pixels and 128 colors, and we liked it. The nostalgia wears off quick on some of the games, but some are still a blast to play. You can find pre-configured images that you can download and install on a hard drive or SSD and be up and running with a slew of console and arcade games in no time. Do a Google search for Board Game Dad and Arcade Punks and uh, you'll see what I mean. Batacera even comes with Kodi as an option to boot straight into it first. It also works great with the now discontinued Stadia controller after you convert it to a Bluetooth controller. RetroPie is pretty much the exact same thing, except it installs on top of a normal Linux install. You can ignore the Pi in the RetroPie name. It works fine on any machine. Like any software, there can be a lot of tweaking required to get it to run the way you want it to. I found that Batacera images tend to be the easiest and the most plug and play, whereas RetroPie required a lot more tinkering. Both use Emulation Station as a base platform to build upon. And of course, the more powerful your machine is, the better emulation performance you'll get. That's why I upgraded in my, the first video I posted, my Elite Desk 800 from an i3 to an i7-4771. With the i7 and 12 gigs of RAM, I can emulate up to the PS2 and original Xbox. With an i7 combined with the graphics card, you'd probably be able to do even more. But I find that the Haswell 4th generation i7 with Batocera does a great job. Another fun thing to do with retro game setups is to mod an arcade one-up machine and install a mini PC inside it to drive it. Or better yet, build your own and use real arcade joysticks and buttons. It really makes the arcade game emulation more visceral and a lot more nostalgic. It's pretty easy to wire up buttons and joysticks using one of these cheap zero delay USB encoder boards you can find on Amazon. There are plenty of arcade cabinet plans online, or you can even buy a pre-cut CNC cabinet from eBay. I'll be making a video on a DIY arcade machine in the future. There's also a great website called arcadecontrols.com that has extensive forums on building your own arcade games. I'll put the link in the description. So another thing I'm using a little low-powered upcycled machine for is something called Open Media Vault. For this I'm using a, this HP T530 fanless thin client with uh, 8 gigs of RAM in it. So Open Media Vault is a great way to make a DIY NAS, which is network attached storage. It basically allows you to create your own storage server and configure it in lots of different ways. It supports creating RAIDs for protected high-speed storage, as well as just JBOD, which is just a bunch of disks. It has an add-on called Merger FS that lets you throw a bunch of different disks together into one continuous pool of storage. It's definitely a bit on the more nerdy side of things and definitely takes some tinkering to set up properly, but once it's working, it seems to be pretty rock solid. I'm just getting started with Open Media Vault, so I'm still kind of learning the ropes. I'm planning on replacing my ancient network attached drive that I've been using for my media library for many years now. Right now I'm just running basic SMB sharing and set up a few users with a few USB drives attached to the thin client. 
Once I become more familiar with the system, I plan to move up to a RAID or at least uh, using a protected storage set with a parity drive. There's a similar open storage server called TrueNAS, which seems to be a little more complicated, maybe a little more enterprise. If I was building a storage system for business, I might consider TrueNAS, but for home, running on a really low-powered machine, I think Open Media Vault seems to be the best bet. Let me know your thoughts on TrueNAS versus Open Media Vault in the comments. Lastly, another cool use for these cheap PCs is something called Home Assistant. This is another Linux-based system that seems to offer a ton of cool stuff, but I have yet to try it out. It's on my Tinker to-do list. From what I gather, it allows you to tie in all your smart devices together. It's sort of like roll your own Alexa for voice control without having to deal with Amazon. You can link your alarm, your camera, your media center, smart plugs, smart bulbs, appliances, all under one ecosystem to do all kinds of cool stuff. Again, there seems to be a, a super active community of developers coming up with all kinds of cool modules that work within the Home Assistant ecosystem. There are even custom firmware packages available for certain security cameras to allow you to provide your own recording and smart detection to avoid having to pay their subscription fees. Again, I'm, I'm kind of clueless about the full capabilities of Home Assistant, but it seems powerful and it definitely has a lot of fans amongst the nerd crew. Check it out at homeassistant.io. So I hope that gives you some ideas of what you can do with these uh, little cheap machines. And uh, do me a favor, let me know what you do with them in the comments. Um, you yeah, know, I'm always curious. I'm sure some of you uh, have figured out some uh, other super interesting things that you can use these little cheap machines for. So do me a favor, leave me a comment, hit that like button, and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Appreciate you guys watching. Thanks.